don't hesitate. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate. Give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind. And much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back. That sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This week on the Poetry of Predicament, let's welcome one of the most prolific authors in this time of collapse and predicament, Carolyn Baker. Carolyn, when she's not writing her own books on how we might comport ourselves in these times of predicament, she's writing with her very dear friend, Andrew Harvey. Whether it's with Andrew or on her own, she's an incredibly valuable voice in terms of finding islands of sanity in these times of bold and daunting insanity. Please help me welcome Carolyn Baker. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. And uh, today's guest, I am really happy to be uh, sitting in conversation with Carolyn Baker, whom I consider to be one of the most senior and significant voices in the Collapse Aware community and conversation, uh, certainly that I've ever met and that I'm aware of. Um, it's not that there haven't been long-standing people who address certain aspects of it. You know, we've got the William Catton, you know, his extraordinary early um, you know, crafter of, an, of a particular, uh, like, cornerstone of the Collapse Aware conversation. But you, Carolyn, have... Uh, have been a long-standing and perhaps the most prolific author I'm aware of uh, in terms of how shall we uh, comport ourselves, as as uh, Darja Mail might say. How shall we comport ourselves? How will we relate with one another and with the earth in a new and important way uh, as we lean into this now obvious and very much present uh, predicament that we're in. Uh, you and I have been able to do some projects together over the years. And uh, even just a few years ago, when we were in the thick of that, there was still so much that was out on the horizon. And, yeah, you know, yeah. we don't know when it's coming, but, you yeah. know, we seem to be fairly certain. So let's talk about it and let's bring in thought leaders and and so on. And, and then now, there were folks who were saying to us, well, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it, it is just a, a joy for me to have you here. I We've just Likewise. been checking in a little bit uh, before turning on the recording button. And I'm just so glad that, uh, that you are doing well. Um, I'm so sorry to hear about your dog dying. And I'm so happy to hear you've got a new dog in your life. And, and I'm so glad to hear that Andrew is doing well. Uh, for those who don't know Carolyn's work, not only have you written many books on your own, but you've also written a handful of books with, uh, with Andrew Harvey, who is an extraordinary character all his own. We can talk about it some other time. Right. 
He's a, definitely a character in his own right and a pioneer in his own right. And uh, I should just say the words sacred activism because yeah. they, they yeah. so ring for me and at the core, core of my experience yeah. of him. Yeah. And, and just, just feisty as hell. And I <laughs> always <laughs> love that as well. <laughs> Which, you know, I'm saying those words that I can see why you and Andrew have so much time together, so much collaboration together, because you also have a feistiness in you. Okay. You have a very strong spirit. And I uh, I wanted to mention, as I did before, the, <clears throat> the Michael Shaw interview that uh, you just did uh, a few weeks back. It was just beautiful. Yeah. You know, we should all, I was just mentioning that we should, we should all be so lucky as to have an interview like that in which yes. we, we are involved, yes. we're called out in a loving and embracing oh, yeah. way yeah. Uh, to really recount what is our body of work and what matters most to us in, the, yeah. in our heart. And you uh, just stepped right up into that invitation. And so, uh, you know, I'll be including the link yes. in the show notes to this yeah. interview so that anybody who doesn't know Carolyn, I'd recommend highly, definitely include that with this one and others that you'll find on YouTube right. and so on, because uh, there's the just the robust love of life and the robust uh, man manifestation or embodiment of authenticity that I think is you in your presence and then especially you in your writings that's what pierces for me and and in the loving and appreciative space of michael shaw's interview you'll get to you know those who are again not familiar with carolyn's work you're going to get a, a remarkable sweetness there of that type yeah. and here you're going to get a little bit more spicy <laughs> hopefully and, <laughs> and that's the part that I uh, that I have come to know and, and appreciate because um, it, it just uh, is a great blend with I have a kind of a uh, kind of a street end of the conversation and energy and presence of, you know that I just really appreciate to be able to call a spade a spade to be able to yeah. really just speak truth to power and to um, have little or no uh, reservation about um, naming that which so needs to be named right. in the name of life, yeah. in the name of what's just true mm -hmm. in this moment. Yeah. And so uh, with all that, hi and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is great to be here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. So there are two things that I think we're going to spend some time on, and it's fine if other things pop in, it's no problem at all. Um, but in popcorn fashion, uh, I'm just curious, what's on your screen these days? What's kind of tends to show up when, you, you know, you're doing your, uh, of course, you're continuing your gorgeous uh, practice of the daily news digest that I'll also link up to in the show notes so that people can find out what you do on a nearly daily basis. You're putting out this, this extraordinary condensed version of, of what are the highlights and perhaps lowlights of the relevant news uh, to date. And you also include always uh, what's inspirational, what, what's warming your heart these days and, and bringing you to the lighter side of the spectrum in a, you know, to balance out the other part of the news. So I'm curious what your, what your focus is drawn to, especially in, if we could call these the troubled times, what kind of trouble are you in these days? <laughs> Well, it reminds me of Maladoma Somme, who said that there's an old proverb in his village uh, in Burkina Faso, where he came from. There's an old proverb that says, um, you know, don't avoid trouble, but make sure you get into the right trouble. Nice. So I'm trying very much these days to be in the right trouble. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for mentioning the Daily News Digest, because for 15 years, I've been publishing the Daily News Digest every single day, unless I'm sick or I'm traveling, um, a, a comprehensive look at economics, the environment, world news, um, uh, conflicts around, you know, democracy. And I have a, a section called the Daily Anti-Democracy Report, mm -hmm. civil liberties, uh, cultural issues. Mm -hmm. And then, as you mentioned, uh, at the very end, an inspiration section, because after you've gone through all of this news, you're going to need some inspiration. And yeah. I try to provide that every single day. And if you want to learn more about how to subscribe to the Daily News Digest, go to my website, carolynbaker.net and click on the subscribe tab and you're there. And it's really a labor of love. I look forward every morning when I get up, I look forward to going to my computer and creating the Daily News Digest. So, yeah. yeah. You know, um, Carolyn, not to put too fine a point on it, but I, in the past five years or so, <clears throat> it's really become... Uh, a, a matter of health for me, and and I would assert for every one of us in this in this world the way it's ended up now, and that we are faced with an onslaught, literally a tsunami, of input, of um, stimulation, yeah. and um, you know just the media, the and social media, and so on. It is such an extraordinary onslaught and, and assault to our senses. And on top of that, it's weaponized. It's predatory. Yeah. You know, it, it's not just that it's a lot. It's a lot and it's intentional and it's built to take us off of our center so that we are more easily manipulated, more easily predicted, and so on. And so why I'm saying that tacked on to what you were just saying about the DMD is I've had to become extraordinarily discerning mm -hmm. about reducing the amount of onslaught I, I'm uh, exposed to every day. Right. And, right. and I really find it, and I, I even uh, have taken it down to not just my occasional visit with the uh, with the DND, but virtually every one of my sources, I've had to just winnow it down to a small mm -hmm. fraction of what I was taken in before. Yeah, I do, I have two, and there are literally hundreds of stories that I see every morning that I don't put in. Right. You know, because yeah. I, I'm very selective about, and I don't mean selective in terms of well, they don't need to know this, but but really, like what matters most. Right, right. You know, I, I'm not going to put in every environmental story that I see because I'd be here forever. But, you know, <laughs> the ones that really, really expose our predicament and, yeah. you know, that are really speaking truth to power. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm very glad you're continuing to do that. And so now to my question. Sure. <laughs> what of those elements that you are exposed to some number of times every day, just like we all are, what seems to be rising to the top of your attention most often these days? What's got your attention? Yeah. What's got my attention is not just our environmental predicament, but everything that goes along with how we've created that predicament. You know, the, the um, gaslighting, the loss of connection with what's real, and, um, you know, the authoritarianism that is attending our demise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to tell you the truth, um, I'm thinking about a next book 
that will have a title something like Undaunted, Living Fiercely into Climate Meltdown in an Authoritarian World. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. what I see is that uh, those of us who are aware of this predicament very much need to have the tools, the resources necessary to go forward and continue, not just to stay alive, but to stay alive and thrive and be with what matters most to us and be present to our predicament with mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. um, that we, we all need those tools and this is not a guarantee that any of us is going to survive, whatever that means, but yeah. rather that we experience this as consciously as we can. It's all in how we view it. And this has been my work since I wrote Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civilizations Collapse. And it's like, now we need tools that we've not had before. We need resources from the inside of us and the outside of us, like we've never needed them before. Right. And so, you know, how do we consciously live into, all right, we're going into climate meltdown, whatever that looks like in my region, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like in the world. And how do I go into that with clear eyes and drawing on the internal resources that I have in here mm -hmm. and the resources that are out there for me and for everyone else. How yeah. do I do that? And, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't guarantee immortality because we're all going to die, mm -hmm. you know, sooner or later, we're all going to die. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of Stephen Jenkinson and people who are really schooling us in how to allow death to inform how we live. Yeah. And so um, that has to be in the mix as well. Yeah. But how do we go into all this with great consciousness and intention yeah. and surrender at the same time that we have intention? You know, right. okay, resilience. How do I adapt? How do I change the direction that I was going? And always, you know, going within to the soul dimension mm. rather than the ego dimension, because the ego's gotten us where we are. Yeah. And what we need now to sustain ourselves and to make the changes that we need to make, as small as they might be, is the deep connection with our soul story. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I am right now. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. You're, you're actually jumping to uh, what I was thinking might be the second part of, of what we dig into and this. That's just fine. Let's jump around. Um, what I would call that is, is the resources that we call on that we anticipate will be needed. Like what are the skills and capacities and core competencies of a person who sincerely wants to expand their ability to be present in the face of larger and larger stressors. You know, what are some of the skills and practices that I would need to integrate into my life to have any hope of expanding my capacity in, a, in the middle of a daily and hourly and, and even more frequently tsunami-like presence of all those forces, be they media, social media, corporate and governmental, you know, uh, influences and so on. What on earth could I could I call on to not just be able to get back up after being knocked down, but actually be able to expand my presence mm -hmm. in the midst of that? So that's just a, I guess, a, just a slightly different way of saying what you just said. And I well, think my, my main way of talking about that is to reclaim our center. 
because mm -hmm. we're, we're just constantly knocked off center and it's been both taken from us and we have perhaps unconsciously forfeited it right so any anybody that does the work that i'm doing we get together really early in the process and start to take an inventory of just how off center each of us is you know it's quite an inventory for i haven't met anybody yet who doesn't have a whole long list of of the costs of having lost or forfeited that center and i'm sorry you were going to say something well, no, I was just going to, going to go into some of the ways that I think it's important for us to recenter ourselves when we get knocked off. Please, yeah, uh, great. I mean, um, one of the first things, and and you know, this is kind of where I started when I wrote Sacred Demise, is it's really important that we pay attention to our emotions, that we pay attention to our denial. You know, like this isn't really happening or um, this is happening, but it's not going to affect me for a lot of years. Um, and so, you know, really confronting that denial, because even those of us who've read a lot and studied a lot and talked a lot about our predicament. You know, we're still in denial on mm -hmm. some levels. Mm -hmm. And so it's coming back to, okay, if I'm not in denial about this, what will I feel? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll feel scared. I'll feel enraged. I'll feel deeply saddened. I'll feel powerless, uh, you know, and on and on and on. Yep. So to become a familiar with our emotions and work with them. And, you know, this might, involve working with a therapist or not it might involve working with a coach or not um, but we need to have some help with that usually because we're very emotionally crippled by this culture and we may think we know about our emotions because we've read about them in a book but what's it like to be in this body with those emotions and then there is the body itself which needs to be attuned which needs to be really cared for and I find everybody needs some kind of body practice every day, whether that's yoga, whether that's going to the gym, which is my thing, mm -hmm. um, whether that's a particular sport, whatever that is, something mm -hmm. that involves the body. And I love the work of our friend, Philip Shepard, yeah. yeah. who helps us really attune these emotions to the body and be present in the body to whatever is going on in the world. Yeah. So those are, those are two things. Um, I find that it's really important to have some kind of spiritual practice or practice that connects us with something greater than the ego mm -hmm. and the rational mind. Uh, because the ego and the rational mind are only part of the story. Our story as a species, our story as individuals is much bigger than that. Yes. So those are some of the resources that I rely on. Yep. Um, and, and to have great compassion for ourselves. Yeah. Great compassion when we get knocked off center. Yeah. Great compassion when we screw up. Yeah. Um, and, and really be willing to communicate with others when we mess up. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the additional things that I want to add, which I may or may not have added in just quite these words maybe a year ago, but I had the privilege recently of interviewing my friend Frank Schaefer. Mm -hmm. Frank Schaefer is a former evangelical. He and his father were instrumental in forming the religious right back in the 80s. And he carried on that ideology for a couple of decades. And then he realized the error of his ways and, and left that all behind and really attended to his wholeness and the healing process and, and um, 
becoming more human instead of trying to become more transcendent and spiritual. And so uh, he's written a number of books and his most recent book is called Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. Now, a lot of people who would see that title would immediately think, oh my God, this guy's probably a climate denier, and this is just a bougie, white, entitled point mm -hmm. of view, and blah, blah. Well, you know, in my interview, he explained very clearly that what he's talking about is something that happened to him during the pandemic. In the pandemic, we were in lockdown, we stayed home, we um, were with our families. People who have children and grandchildren took care of, of those young, young beings. And for many of people who were in lockdown and had to be with their families and had to do a lot of caretaking, it changed them. And Frank says, it's kind of like the pandemic turned around and looked at us and said, how is this all working for you? This <laughs> going to work from nine to five, mm -hmm. this selling your soul to your job, this identifying with your career, you know, this time that takes you away from what matters most. Mm -hmm. How's that working for you? And, you know, Frank had the privilege of I think he took care of like five grandchildren over the course of the pandemic mm -hmm. and he was with them every day. And, you know, parents were in one room with one child and helping it be online for school. And another parent might've been over here. You know, it was kind of like a communal situation to some extent. And, you know, what Frank realized is that what really matters most in these extremely troubled times is that we are caring for each other. Mm -hmm. And so it has nothing to do with whether we have biological children or grandchildren. It has to do with how are we parenting in our community? How are we parenting in our families? How are we parenting the earth? And you know, I look at myself and, and, you know, for decades, I've been parenting. I was parenting as a therapist. I'm parenting as a coach. You know, I'm parenting in the books I write. When you facilitate your groups on Tuesday night, you're parenting. Mm -hmm. And to, to get into ourselves the importance of caring for each other. You know, just as it takes a village to raise a child, it's going to take a village for all of us to navigate collapse and climate meltdown. It's going to require that. Now, it doesn't mean we have to become, you know, we live in intentional communities. 98% of those fail, mm. you know, but how, how are we caring for others? It can be in the smallest ways. Mm -hmm. We don't have to stay home for a year and bake bread and take care of five grandchildren. But how are we caring for the earth? You know, mm -hmm. in little ways, in big ways, how are we caring for the community? And of course, how are we caring for ourselves? Yeah. Well, I, I absolutely get that. And I'm looking forward to reading that book. I, I have got a way too tall a, a shelf full of books to be read but i'm happy to put that one at the top and at the moment and and uh, give it a go i'm what i'm liking about what you're saying is it really brings it to the personal and to the relationship level at the very personal level because uh, i'm i'm noticing that what what seems to be a an exponential curve of insanity going on in our world these days, where as soon as it gets out to the social media level, which is almost immediately for most of us, 
you know, given the past year and a half plus. But as soon as it gets gets to that level where we're we're rippling out through those vehicles, through those those predatory vehicles with our attention and so on, there's um, multiple layers of influences that take us away from that simple truth that you were just pointing to, the simple truth of the moment of this is, I'm here in this home with these people, with my grandchildren, and here is the, here's the right action in this moment. And there's something so elemental about that. It's, it's something that, that uh, social media and, and an internet-based reality will never be able to duplicate. No. It, it, you know, AI is going to become more and more powerful, but it sure. just, in in my seeing, it just won't be able to replace that that truthfulness, that authentic uh, connection in the moment, and that authentic choice point that I was hearing you talk about, mm -hmm. that I can discern for myself what is what brings most of what matters most to me. Mm -hmm in this moment, in this relationship. So I'm, I'm hearing that kind of simplicity and there's a, a way in which my own system just relaxes in hearing that. Yeah, and one, sure. of the, one of the spicier issues to answer my own earlier question about what's, what's kind of showing up on my screen that if it's not triggering me, it, it would sure want to, it sure wants to. And sometimes it's successful in doing that there's just been so much literally kind of a blend of craziness or, or insanity. And sometimes it's called st stupidity. And uh, there's a particular book that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing if I can remember the off author of it by the time we end up um, in our conversation. Uh, it, it's not just calling somebody stupid and, you know, it's kind of a surface term these days, but, but literally like a willful ignorance. Mm -hmm. And there are, la it seems like that's layer upon layer. Mm -hmm. And so there's the, um, the polarization that's tending to have people be literally at an aggressive, even violent expression level with one another. That that's it's if it's not actually happening, it's latent in so many pockets in our world, and then we can take that same tendency and we can really just aim it at the whatever the the cause of the moment is, the trigger of the moment. If it's if I'm an anti-vaxer or an anti-masker or um, uh, someone who's expressing my my um, built-in uh, race, racism, you know, that just the suppression of votes and so on. And the, it, what was happening in the middle of the pandemic time, it was just absolutely shocking to me was there was this kind of rallying, this encouraged rallying to threaten public officials and threaten people who are public servants, you know, like the people who are recently um, in charge of voting in a particular jurisdiction. And people are are literally hunting them down and threatening them. Yeah. So there's this uh, extraordinary. It's, again, I'm just kind of noticing from that relatively simple and so easy to hear in, in a heartfelt way, an authentic way of relating in that simple way of, you know, I'm here with my grandchild and so on. And as soon as it steps out the door, it just seems like it escalates through layers of thick layers layered one on top of another of disconnection, deeper and deeper disconnection from that simplicity, from that authentic connection. So I don't know if I've said that in a way that sparks you to say anything, but that's that's yeah. an area of concern that I got. So, um... I don't want to pin this all on one thing, but I think it's extremely important for us to understand that our situation right now is very similar 
to the situation in Germany in the Weimar Republic around 1937 and 1938. Um, we are very much mirroring the conditions that brought in full-blown fascism. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to subtitle, you know, my next book, um, you know, being, being uh, a living um, fiercely into all of these uh, dilemmas at a time when the world is becoming more and more authoritarian. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the madness is that um, many people just don't see any alternative except to have some big daddy or mama who's going to take charge. Mm -hmm not necessarily fix it, but take charge and, and allow us to be bullies and allow us to be stupid and allow us to do whatever the fuck we want. Because that's part of what this, all of the anti-vaxxing and anti-masking is all about. I'm gonna do what the fuck I want and screw you. Mm -hmm. You can't make me, it's like two years old, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, given my background, being raised in an evangelical fundamentalist Christian family, mm -hmm. I felt really compelled earlier this year and, and had a tremendous sense of urgency as I wrote my latest book, Confronting Christofascism, Healing the Evangelical Wound. And part of it is history. Part of it is how do we get to this place where, where fascism and Christianity are dancing together? Um, part of it is the psychology of fundamentalism, which when you get into that, you'll see how it fits so beautifully with the rest of our, our pathology in this culture. Part of it is memoir. I have a chapter on my own story. And then I finish up with a plea to you know, we've got to come back to critical thinking. We've got to call out fascism for what it is. Uh, I have some, some quotes in here uh, from Jason Stanley, who's a, a specialist at Harvard, a philosophy professor on fascism. And of course, um, Tim Snyder, who wrote the wonderful book on tyranny and is another uh, expert on fascism and fascist trends in a culture. So I just think we have to understand, you know, what fascism is and how it's showing up in our culture. And the whole, the whole issue of voter suppression and gerrymandering mm -hmm. is making voting, eventually it's going to be, I think, uh, a very ugly experience and an experience that people don't even want to put themselves through. Right. And eventually I think it's going to be, well, the hell with voting, it's too much trouble. Let's let these guys decide it. You know, this committee decide it or this president decide it. Um, like we see in other places like Hungary right now and mm -hmm. uh, other countries that are moving further and further right into authoritarian trajectories all the time. Yeah. So, you know, I don't want to say, well, fascism is at the root of all this insanity, but it right. plays a big part. And yeah. that's where we're going. Yeah. And one of the things we did not have in this Congress, and I don't see it happening before the 2022 elections, nobody passed a voting rights bill. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's a watershed moment. Yep. Because if you don't have a clear voting rights bill that ends voter suppression and ends gerrymandering, you don't have a democracy. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that we have this pure, pristine democracy because we never have had a pure, pristine democracy, <laughs> but we've got one of the better ones in the world. Yeah. And so we're about to lose it, I believe. And that is going to make climate chaos and everything else so much worse. Yeah. So do we need to be grounded in 
spiritual practices, body practices, emotional work, and a sense of caring and parenting of our community and the earth, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I also want to recommend the work of Meg Wheatley. Mm -hmm. You're very familiar with her work. She recently wrote a wonderful article on stop being addicted to hope and mm -hmm. stop being addicted to the outcome. COP26, it's going to be another joke. You know, stop being addicted to the outcomes of these long range, grandiose plans. They're going to fail. They are failing. And so we, we, we don't try to change the, the entire planet. We don't try to change the big picture. We live in the little picture and do the little things every day that are right because they are right. Yeah. I hear you. And I appreciate that kind of journey you just took us on. A bit on. of long-windedness, but hey. Oh, no, I'm with you. I, I, I would actually like to add just a, a bit to it. And I think it was applied in so much of what you were saying. It's stunning to me how in these past couple of years, in particular, what was once at least behind a, a thin veneer of smoke and mirrors, a thin veneer of, oh, we, we actually do care what our voters want and so on. There's no more veneer. The veneer has been shredded. Absolutely. And now it's being done right out in the open. And um, I find that extraordinarily disturbing. And it really is just underscores everything you just said. You know what we really, if this, this is the time if we haven't if a person hasn't by now found their people it's time to find your people time time to find a, a small circle uh, as big as you can find a circle of support a, cir a circle that can uh, hold space for each other as we do that the inner work that you've been talking about if it's be getting the basics of shadow dynamics at the individual and, and group level, if it's uh, learning how to grieve together, learning how to become more emotionally literate, each of those pieces, they just need to be learned yeah. in, a, in a circle of kindred spirits. There's just no other way to do it. Right. And so I'm with you. I am I'm just, uh, you know, very, very concerned. Um, some of these elements that uh, that are so much a part of what you and I are talking about today, I actually did a pretty good job of predicting when I put out my own book, uh, The Impossible Conversation, back in 2017. Yes, I predicted about two years, and there would be such a flood of related material that related to one or or, or another of the predicaments that we were all in. For instance, you know, climate change, the most obvious, and then the five or six other global scale predicaments like habitat destruction, species extinction, blah, blah, blah. All those, sir, I, I came pretty close there. So yay me and, and one out of what, 100 or whatever. Um, but what I, what I could not have predicted is how bald-faced these elements are now in our culture the the absolute shredding of uh, what's left of the uh the fabric of our communitas together what's left of that that fledgling barely hanging in democracy it's just getting shredded and i i could not have have predicted that and that, that's definitely been hard on my heart because it's just heartbreaking it is. And when I when I combine that with what you you kind of touched on it, and I I guess I'd just like to mention this so we can talk about it if there's something to be talked about. Is uh, there was a point in the middle of the first pandemic year where um, there were a number of reports of uh, retirement homes, uh, you know, elder care homes, where there was just ravaging uh they're being ravaged by the uh covid infections and and similarly in 
a number of meatpacking houses in the Midwest. It was just, I, I it was jaw dropping for me. I literally would, I couldn't breathe just hearing the reports. And so there's these elements of how cruel we can be collectively. And it seemed pretty clear to me that we just, couldn't even see it when it was on the screen coming out at us collectively. Like, how? what am I willing to look the other way about in order to maintain my level of comfort and my la level of stability in my world? You know, really kind of like, without saying the words, screw them. So make them go to work. As long as I can buy my chicken when I go to the market, I'm in good shape. Right, right. And as long as, you know, I don't have anybody in a, in a retirement home. So screw them. Yeah. Well, my dad was in a retirement home uh, mm -hmm. in a nursing home in Indiana. Um, and he died of COVID last August, August 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, my cousin and I said goodbye to him on Zoom. Yeah. Um, yeah, which I never could have imagined. And it's it's like so many of the politicians who are anti-vax mm -hmm. and who are um, saying, you know, well, you know, there aren't that many COVID, inf there really aren't that many cases. And, you know, meanwhile, it's just ravaging their states. I think of Ron DeSantis. Right. Oh, we don't have that much COVID. And it's just ravaging the state of Florida. And, um, you know, it's all about, well, we want to make Biden look bad yeah. or we want to, you know, voter suppression or something else. You know, we're going to look the other way. The cruelty is off the charts. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely off the charts. You know, maybe I'll get asked to be Biden's vice president if I make or, or uh, Trump's vice president, if I make Biden look bad, right. you know, whatever it takes. The slaughter, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, so it's this absolute sociopathy mm -hmm. of the culture. Um, and I think a lot of the same is going on with the, with the madness around guns. Yes. Um, the violence is soon going to be off the charts. And, you know, I, I wonder... How many of us will even want to go outside and get in our cars and drive because it won't be safe? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I can only wonder. Yeah. So if it's all right, I'd, I'd just like to pause for a moment. Um, you just shared a lot and you started with your own With your own and I'm sharing about your own father last year and um, thank you for sharing that uh, even though this is my work and I know it's yours as well to be able to work with people coach people encourage their expansion of their emotional literacy their their ability to integrate grief in a good way into their lives and so on. I noticed that I was starting to just in recounting my perspective about these triggers for myself. I was, I was less and less connected with my heart, with the other elements of my, you know, my, my implicit senses and so on. I wasn't breathing much, I was breathing very shallowly. And I was starting to speed up in the pace of my speaking. So I'm just pausing for a moment. And I'm saying all this, not because I know you know this stuff, Carolyn, but I just want to speaking for the folks who are watching that this is perhaps a, a bridge between these immense global and national triggers back down to that authentic level, that simple level, that heart-to-heart -heart level in the moment. 
that if I don't take that pause, I'll just go back into the same pacing and the same head orientation and the same distance from my own heart and my own body. And, you know, you really just gave us a, a perfect opportunity to, to pause. But these are real people, real relationships. And, you know, right at the heart of the content of what we happen to be talking about. But there's a, a relationship moment available when we pause. So thanks for sitting through my just kind of walking it through and piece by piece to bridge us back from that rapid fire, you know, list my listing off my, you know, what this is what triggers me today, blah, 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 mm -hmm. to just what it takes. It really doesn't take much yeah. to be able to bring ourselves consciously back to where we can feel in a way that is far closer to what uh, Ian McGilchrist might call our, our implicit senses mm -hmm. and uh, what uh, you know, Michael Mead or Francis Weller and any number of others that we both know pretty well um, would call you know, basically our soul. It's always that close. It's always available. It's just whether I take the pause to, to get us back there. So thank you for that. Yeah, and it's really important that we pause to let the grief in mm -hmm. because we're, 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 in, we're in oceans of grief right mm -hmm. now in mm -hmm. our world. And you know, if we let every single bit in, we wouldn't even be able to function. But to take the time to let some of it in, because it's really a gift from the universe, yeah, a gift from the gods, mm -hmm. I believe, to, to allow that grief, to work with it, to let it move us into action and into a place of joy. Yeah. I say the quickest way to get to joy is through our grief. Yeah. So I don't know how it's showing up in, in your system, but I, I'd like to just explore and, and, and articulate just a little bit more. I call it this neighborhood, this neighborhood where grief is, mm -hmm. is welcome and invited. Yeah. And I noticed that uh, what before was a kind of a linear tracking of and listing of well, I want to say this point, and I want to mention this, and this is some I'm angry about, and so on. It was particular qualities of emotion and particular qualities of judgment and linearity and mental. And since we've taken this pause, I'm noticing that that there's more of a blank slate. Just as you, the last piece you were saying, I was noticing like this blank slate that I could just kind of receive what you were saying to let in that grief and let it make an impression on my system without resisting it, in fact, inviting it, and to welcome kind of the backside of it, which you were also, you also articulated, which is if, if I let that in, I let it really flow through, that there's at least that blank slate-ness Mm -hmm. I'm available and I'm awake and I'm present with you and I'm present with this moment. And then if I let it just wash through a little bit further, I, there, there might actually be some joy there. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> well, I have to share a Mary Oliver poem about that. Well, that would be perfect. <laughs> she says, don't hesitate. If you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate, give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We are not wise and not very often kind. And much can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps 
this is its way of fighting back. That sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything, but very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Hey, Carolyn, I wonder if that might be a good ending point. I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, at the risk of being repetitive, uh, back to the beginning of our conversation, I, I you know, just so honor the, the path you have laid out for so many of us in your books and your, your work with people. And um, it's just been a, a joy to reconnect with you and I'm so glad that you are doing well and Andrew's doing well and <clears throat> heck that you even have a new dog in your life. I'm, uh, as you, I think, remember, I, I'm in my first round of being a, a dog person and uh, it is extraordinary. Yeah. And, um, and he's I so just, sweet. Your bow is so sweet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He is he is a light worker. He is, yeah, like, he is. is so emotionally literate. It's it's astounding. Yeah. So thank you for so much for coming on and uh, thank you for having me. I think we got to see just a little bit of the the spicy side, and that's a good thing. Yeah. And I particularly appreciated your admonitions for us of the kind of one, two, three punches that are stacking up out there, yeah. and. Uh, I particularly appreciate your your really leaning hard into the the recommended recommended qualities of and types of inner and out external resources that we can start to call on in these times. You know, it's so much what you've been uh, offering up for so many years, but this is uh, the next layer of refinement. And so I, I'm looking forward to whatever your next book is and next chapter is. And um, just really good to be with you. Good to be with you as well. Thank you so much for having me come on. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance. www.livingresilience.net music today from Michael Hedges as always and also put Blue Into the Sea. Also available on our website www.livingresilience.net is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.